So as I mentioned, it'll be a slightly shorter sermon this morning. I won't spend quite as long recapping previous weeks as I perhaps ordinarily would, but just a couple of sentences to help us understand what is going on as we come into this passage. Our passage um, features a man called Paul. Paul was a man who once hated God and yet was saved by God's amazing grace, transformed from someone who persecuted Christ to someone who proclaimed Christ and preached the glorious message of the gospel, that no one is so lost that they cannot be found. No one is so far off that they cannot be brought near. No one is so sinful that they cannot be saved. Jesus has the power to save souls. And he's still doing it today. And we've seen evidence of it in our service this morning. If you turn from your sin, put your trust in Jesus, ask him to save you, he will save you. It is as simple as that. So Paul has been preaching that message since the day of his own salvation. And last week, Paul and his companions uh, turned up in a place called Pisidian Antioch. Um, They sat in the synagogue because they were ethnically Jewish. That would be a very normal thing for them to do um, when visiting a new region. And then after the reading of the scriptures, they were invited to say a word or two about the passage that had just been read. And so last week, uh, we saw Paul just take the baton and run with it, that he seized the opportunity. He told a room full of people about how the scriptures that they know were all pointing forward to the savior that he loves. They were pointing forward to Jesus. And so our passage picks up this morning at the end of Paul's sermon, where Paul and his friend Barnabas were leaving the synagogue. And we read there in verse 42, that the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. Now, this is a a wonderful response from those who had heard this message. You might remember last week, Paul finished preaching with a pretty serious, pretty sobering warning to them all saying, look, if if you reject the Lord of life, you will be left with everlasting death. If you reject the light of the world, you will live in everlasting darkness. If you reject the God who is love, you will be left with an existence that is full of hatred and bitterness and dissatisfaction and sorrow and sin. Jesus has come to save you from your sins. But, now listen to this, if you reject Jesus you are left with nothing more than the judgment you deserve. Paul says some hard things to them, things that are not easy on the ears, but evidently many people responded to that message, not with hostility, but with humility. They wanted to hear more. Look, Paul, if that's true, tell us more, won't you? If it's true that Jesus has come to save us from our sins and they are as serious as you say, Goodness, don't stop after one sermon. (laughs) Tell us more. Tell us all we need to know. Come back next week. Show us from the scriptures that these things are true, that we might have life and not death. Let me just say a word here about the voices that you listen to in life. I think it's probably true to say that this world is noisier now than it has ever been before. Never before in human history has there been a generation where so many people... (laughs) multitudes of people have megaphones in their hands, digitally speaking, and they shout their message or their perspective into the world 24-7. And the temptation in a world like this is firstly just to be so overwhelmed with information that you can't really discern what is true from what is false, what matters and what doesn't, what is temporary and fleeting and what is eternal. It's sometimes hard to tell what to listen to And secondly, the temptation is to seek out messages that will tell you what you want to hear. The Bible says there is a time coming when people will not put up with truthful teaching, but instead, to suit their own desires, will find people who proclaim messages that scratch their itching ears. (laughs) Could there be a more accurate description of our own day and age? If you have a certain desire you will find some teacher somewhere with an open Bible in front of them saying, that's fine, keep going, do what you want. But what we need is not to have our ears tickled, but to be told the truth. 
And so to the credit then of this crowd in the synagogue, they are told some things that are hard to hear and they understand the seriousness of it. And they don't try and close this operation down or shut the Apostle Paul up. They say instead, please tell us more. We want to be made right with the living God. Verse 42 says, the people invited them to speak further about these things. Actually, the Greek has a real intensity in that idea of being invited. It is closer to the people begged them to speak further about these things. They are desperate for the truth. They are hungry for reality. And it seems that already after just one single sermon in the synagogue, a great many of them were taking steps in faith in their Christian journey, such that Paul and Barnabas had to, end of verse 43, urge them to continue in the grace of God. They've already made some spiritual progress. They've already taken some spiritual steps. They've understood that right relationship with God is a gift of grace. It's given by him as a gift. It is not achieved by some religious performance, but received as a free gift of grace. And so he says, continue in the grace of God. Continue trusting him. Continue walking with him. Continue living for him. And indeed, they did. Can you imagine the beautiful, wholesome disruption in that community the day after that synagogue meeting. Perhaps a few dozen people from that synagogue meeting turning from their sin, putting their trust in Jesus and beginning to walk with him. Imagine these people returning to their families and sharing what had happened to them. Imagine as they go back to their workplaces, as they share that they know Jesus to be the son of God and savior of the world. Imagine how every aspect of that little community in Pisidian Antioch would be disrupted by this transformation taking place in the lives of these now Christians. And so the next Sabbath, verse 44, we read, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Can you picture a scene like that? Almost the whole city turning up at a single synagogue. Last week, we had a guest with us, and if he's here with us again, I don't want him to feel awkward about this, but after a moment speaking with him on the door, it prompted me to go and dig out um, this little book that we have. You might have it as well, The History of Moordown Baptist Church, um, because a previous pastor here was very good friends with um, none other than Cliff Richard. And uh, so in an era when Cliff was outrageously popular, um, he was invited to come and perform in this very room, as I understand it. And there were, as the accounts from the Daily Echo confirm, queues around the block at this very church to get in to see dear Cliff. Well, it's a similar thing going on in the text here in Pisidian Antioch. Just crowds of people, more than the building could possibly fit. Queues around the block, almost the whole town, it seems, turning up for this event. Uh, But interestingly, in Antioch at least, it's not so they could be charmed by the velvety voice of Sir Cliff, but rather challenged (laughs) By the words of the living God. They want to hear these hard truths. They wanted to hear the word of God preached. And so they came. However, bad news, verse 45. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Almost always in the New Testament, when that phrase, the Jews, is used, it's referring to the Jewish leaders or members of the uh, kind of Jewish religious establishment. Um, We know that a lot of Jews in this region have put their trust in Jesus, for example. So the Jews here is not just talking about individual Jewish people. Um, Lots of people are not opposing Paul and Barnabas. Um, We know that there are also a lot of Gentiles who have been drawn to the God of the scriptures and have now put their trust in Jesus to be not just the Jewish Messiah, but the savior of all those who put their trust in him. So large numbers of people have responded with humility, repentance, and faith to the message that they have been told. But what we see now is that the Jewish leaders, the religious establishment, they are not best pleased. And so they begin to, as we read, contradict and heap abuse on Paul. Now, it's just heartbreaking to think that these Jewish leaders could have received this very message with joy. But instead, they were consumed with jealousy. We saw from Paul's sermon last week that Jesus is the fulfillment of all that was promised in the Old Testament. And the Jews have the Old Testament. The Jews know the Old Testament. The Jews love the Old Testament. And all those promises are kept 
in Jesus. And all those prophecies are fulfilled by Jesus. And these Jewish leaders then, who know the scriptures better than most, they ought to have heard this message about Jesus and rejoiced. Instead, they looked at the crowd gathering for this message and it provoked their pride. And not only did they reject the Lord of life, they did their best to stop others from hearing and receiving the good news as well. And so Paul and Barnabas respond, they answer boldly, verse 46. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Why do they have to? Well, firstly, because the Holy Spirit had led them, I think, to, to go to the synagogues to share the good news with their fellow Jews. And secondly, I think it's out of a personal desire to see those that they love and are close to come to faith in Jesus. That they were drawn to sharing the gospel with the Jews because they were Jewish. Likewise, if you've put your trust in Jesus, if you've been forgiven of your sins, you will want to tell those that you are close with and drawn to. You will want to, naturally, just tell them about Jesus. So we had to, an internal compulsion as much as anything else, that the Messiah has come. But since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Paul is quoting again from the Jewish scriptures to make his point, uh, to show that this is not a new idea or a strange new development, this turning to the Gentiles to teach them about the coming of the Jewish Messiah. No, the longing of the prophets has been that not just Jews, but even Gentiles would be gathered into the kingdom of God. So Paul says, look, Fine, we will share the good news with others who are more ready than you to receive it. We're not going to let you stop our mission. That the message of who Jesus is and what he has done was intended, not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. That salvation might be brought to the ends of the earth. That people from every tongue and tribe and nation will hear and will respond to what Jesus has done. So Paul says, if you won't listen... We will speak to those who will. Verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. Again, this is a beautiful response, isn't it? And unlike the Jews, these Gentiles didn't have the same access to or appreciation of the Old Testament scriptures. They, as a people group have not been prepared for thousands of years to receive the Messiah. And yet, when they hear the good news, they just respond to the good news. Let me ask you, what about you? How do you respond to the good news of the gospel? Maybe you grew up doing religious things, attending church, maybe even reading your Bible. Perhaps you went to a Christian school, or your grandfather was a preacher, or you grew up in a Christian country, and so you have always considered yourself to be kind of right with God, a cultural Christian, as some might say. But how do you respond to Jesus? Do you repent before him? Do you put your trust in him? Do you build your life around him? Because religion cannot save you. You need righteousness that comes not from yourself, but from the living God. Many people respond that way. That's all right. I've got a bit of religion in my life already. I don't really need any more. Perhaps, though, you respond like the Gentiles in this passage. Maybe you don't have a long history of interaction with the scriptures. Maybe you're not steeped in church culture. Maybe you don't come from a Christian family. But maybe you've heard that Jesus can save you from your sins, that Jesus can give you everlasting life. Maybe you've seen the powerful witness of the people who have been baptized today. And maybe you've thought to yourself, yeah, they have what I need, relationship with the living God. Now, sometimes it happens as spontaneously and as beautifully as that. Listen to this. When the Gentiles heard, they believed. <laughs> they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Now, it doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out fight. Decades of resisting, hardening your heart, walking away from the Lord, reluctantly coming back. You don't have to go through all that. Today, if you hear the voice of the Lord calling, do not harden your heart. You could just become a Christian today and be made right with the Lord for all eternity. Let me read just the last couple of verses of this passage and then we'll conclude. But the Jewish leaders incited the Jewish, the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city 
They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. You know, there is so much that is surprising, unexpected in there. It could be another sermon in itself. But just notice that the response of the disciples is not frustration and dejection, but joy, <laughs> being filled with the Holy Spirit. These disciples are able to trust that being rejected by people in one area is not the end of the story. It's simply the Lord moving them on to a new area. And there is much work to do. So they don't allow themselves to get discouraged or despondent or defeated. No, they look to the Lord and they persevere in faith. And we'll pick up the story of what happened in Iconium next week. As we close, though, I just want you to consider your own personal response to the message of the gospel. Because today, with all that you've seen and heard with these baptisms, and with a passage that so clearly puts before you the fact that there is a right way to respond and a wrong way to respond to the gospel, today would be a good day to choose life and make Jesus your Lord. So here we see some accept and some reject. And in some ways, it's surprising who falls into which category. A whole load of Jews who on the surface, you might expect to be able to see the storyline of the scriptures and the fulfillment that is found in Jesus. You might expect these people to recognize their own Messiah and put their trust in him. And yet, many of them, particularly the leaders who know the scriptures best and yet have a vested interest in keeping things the way they are so that they perhaps remain in their positions of power, they reject the Lord of life. That's a surprise, isn't it? Let me say to you, There are some people who are steeped in the scriptures, who outwardly appear godly, people who say the right kind of things, attend the right kind of meetings, seem altogether very religious. But the question is, how have they responded to the Lord Jesus Christ? Maybe that's you. Maybe you do lots of religious things. I would ask you, but what do you make of Jesus? Is your trust in Jesus? Are you perhaps trusting in your religious performance that God will be pleased with me because I attended church this often or I sat in on these study groups or I served on those rotors? If you are not right with Jesus, those things are little more than acts of spiritual self-righteousness. You cannot save yourself. That is why Jesus came to do for you what you could not do for yourself, to deal with your sin once and for all. Whatever you do, don't live life looking religious but rejecting the Lord God, like the people in this passage. What a disaster that would be. Perhaps you are like one of these unlikely converts. Uh, people perhaps might look at you and, uh, and think on the surface, you know, that person would, would never be interested in Christianity. That person would never be interested in the things of God, for whatever reason. Um, they're too young. <laughs> they don't really grasp it. haven't got the life experience. They're too old. They're too set in their ways. They won't change now. Too rebellious too stubborn. They don't seem churchy or religious or enough like me. (laughs) For whatever reason, it is important that you hear this. God does not save a certain type of person. He saves people of all different ages, from all different backgrounds, out of all kinds of enslaving patterns of sin, and he totally sets them free. So whoever you are and whatever you have done, I want you to know the gospel is for you. You have the option, right now even, to receive everlasting life. If you want it, you can take it. How do you do that? Well, you simply believe. You put your faith in Jesus. You ask him to save you, trusting that he can and that he will. You might pray something like, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know my sin separates me from you. I want you to deal with that sin and forgive me that I might be with you for all eternity. Something as simple as that, from your heart. It would be heard by the living God and acknowledged by him. If you want everlasting life, you can have it. (laughs) That offer of the gospel is so simple that a child could accept it and receive it. And it's also so challenging to our own pride to admit our sin, to ask to be saved. It is so challenging that many of the most religious people you have ever met will never receive Jesus as their Lord. So the question for you today then, how will you respond to the offer of everlasting life? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the work that you did in Pisidian Antioch 2,000 years ago. And Lord, we thank you that your work did not stop there. That your messengers did not give up on the power of the gospel after a few people rejected it, but rather they kept on traveling and preaching and planting churches and sharing the good news. 
We thank you that that has happened now thousands and thousands of times all over the world, down through the centuries. That by your grace, the gospel has been brought to our own country, to our own area, and indeed to our own ears even today. We pray that it will reach not just our ears, but our hearts, that we might be saved by your amazing grace. If we are proud, would you humble us and cause us to accept Jesus? If we are humble, if the soil is indeed soft in our hearts, we ask that you will give us the courage to not delay turning to Christ. But today, having seen these baptisms and heard these stories and studied this passage today, to put our trust in you and likewise be saved by your amazing grace. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen.